So uh, my name is Matt McDermott. I'm a SharePoint MVP. Um, I'm also an independent consultant. I'm a social guy. I'm a dog guy. So you'll see dogs peppered all through my uh, all through my demo. And um, uh, what we're here to talk about is uh, kind of how to develop social apps, or really how to use some different options that you can put into your toolkit for working with SharePoint 2013 and the social API. And um, I've got a whole bunch of demos that I'll show you, both working on box and off box. And hopefully this, along with all of the other sessions that you've been looking at this week, or will consume later on, because I know you didn't go to every session, um, will help you get to uh, understand kind of what the whole social ecosystem is within SharePoint 2013. So there are some components to social that you want to look at when you're thinking about how you're going to architect your solution. I'm not going to propose to you what social means or what it means to your company or how you want to use it. I'm going to try to provide you sort of some tools that you can use. The first you're going to be using is the user profiles. User profiles have been around for quite a long time. It's a real mature technology inside of SharePoint. They keep adding new capabilities every time. And, um, and so the user profile is really how you're going to keep track of your people. I still have clients who have used SharePoint since 2003 who will come back to me and say, we want to do this application where we get some attribute of the user. Like, for instance, we want to grab their, their Twitter ID and have them opt in if they're using Twitter and we want to go get their, get their Twitter feed and put that on their user profile. How hard is that? Well, you've already got the storage in the user profile. You can already add that attribute. If an employee adds their Twitter handle, they're opting in. Okay? If they make it public, they're opting in. So there's sort of an implicit ability inside of SharePoint to be able to edit your own user profile. But what a lot of companies don't realize that are using SharePoint is you can also prevent the end user from ever seeing the attributes that you're putting on the user profile. So if you want to put things that are not necessarily quite as confidential as their Twitter handle, but you still don't want them to see it, you can still decorate the user profile with custom properties. And there are sessions this week that talk about how to work with the user profile service from an IT pro perspective. And then I'll show you today how we can work with it from a developer perspective. The, uh, the next item would be your social feeds. So in 2010, we had the news feed architecture. The news feed architecture re revolved around this concept of gathering and then populating the news feed. It was challenging to work with. It was great fodder for me as a presenter because I had great sessions on how to build these gatherers and everything. And thank goodness I don't have to do those sessions anymore because we have a new way of populating these feeds. We can use the RESTful interfaces. We can use CSOM. We can use the server-side object model to go after these feeds and populate the, uh, populate the end user feeds. And the feeds are much richer now. We have mentions. We have keywords, hashtag keywords. And we have video and links, imagery, that we can inject into it so that we can show off more information in the feeds than we ever had before. So I see this as a big plus. We also have much more performance. So on the front end, the feeds are part of the App Fabric caching infrastructure built into SharePoint, which makes them highly performant. It does, in a demo environment, tend to make them a little bit tricky to work with because you have to make sure certain things are running correctly. But in the RTM version, it's very stable, and it's extremely performant. So when you're calling your REST endpoints, instead of using the server-side object model, you're pulling that straight out of the cache, and your REST, your REST requests are very quick, very fast. You also have a following infrastructure. Yesterday, Andrew Harris did a really great um, presentation where I think he used the word following about 400 times in one sentence, talking about who follows who and how to get the followers. In his session, he went through some code on how to track who's following who and comparing who you're following, which we used to call colleagues and now we call followers. But in 2010, you could never see without code, you couldn't see natively 
who's following you. So they've added that to 2013 so that it's in the UI. You can see not just who you follow, who you have colleagued, but also who has done that for you. And now we have that additional information to sort through in our social apps. The last one I want you to never forget about is search. Search is extremely powerful in 2010 when we're working with things like collecting, collecting information about users. It's more performant than going directly to the user profile service, significantly more performant. And you can actually execute carefully crafted queries to pull back information about end users. In 2013, this has only gotten better. So we now have a REST query service so that if we want to work off box, we can use the REST service to execute the things we used to use, the search.azimex web service to go after. And we can do a much better job in our applications of creating high performance client side applications that call the search service to execute those things that you might have assumed previously that you could only do on box with the server side object model. So the first thing I want you to think about is planning your app. Prototype heavily. And by the end of this, I'll tell you a story about where I made a mistake too. So prototype heavily, learn what you can and can't do, and then when your CIO and CEO and chief marketing officers start talking to you about the cool social things they want to add to your intranet, you'll have an idea of what you can and cannot do. The truth is, in 2013, there is a significant amount more that you can do with social than you could do in 2010. It is a significant improvement. But there are some very specific changes that change what you cannot do in 2013 that you used to be able to do in 2010. And I'll talk about those in just a sec. So when you're planning your app, you want to start with how are you going to connect? Where are you going to connect from? If you're connecting from the server, you're going to, then you have the server-side object model, which means you can use pretty much all of the tools in your toolkit to handle any of the ideas that you want to implement. Of course, if you're using the server-side object model, that will not work in the cloud. So this would be a, an on-prem offering or an on-prem opportunity for you to develop against, the, uh, get, develop against your on-premise SharePoint environment. Now, if you're going to connect from JavaScript or other client technology, and, and I don't just, the reason I didn't say a browser is because you now have tools like PhoneGap that are essentially JavaScript libraries that run on multi platform phone devices. That means that the JavaScript object model is available to you for your JavaScript programming, and you can also use the REST API. So you don't even have to use the SharePoint provided JavaScript libraries, you can write your own. And I think um, Rob Bogue did a developer session here at the conference de um, detailing that RESTful interface and how you can go through and create your own REST libraries. You also have the remote.NET client. So if you're going to write a .NET application, or if you're going to um, write a plugin for a technology like CRM, then you can use the .NET libraries and the .NET object model to be able to go against SharePoint. If you're writing a SharePoint app, then you can use the JavaScript, .NET, CSOM, and um, REST API depending on how you develop your app, whether it's a SharePoint hosted app, an auto hosted app, or, um, or other solutions that you develop. I think Nick Swan just a, an, an hour ago did a Ruby on Rails app. So you know, depending on how you're building your app, you have a lot of options. And then finally, if you're developing for phone, um, then you can use the JavaScript models, or you can look at using the, uh, the Silverlight API if you're writing for Windows Phone 7, 5, or 8. Now, in 2013, the person ecosystem has changed. We've still got the user profile. We still have that person entity, and it becomes the center of our, of our, um, of our universe when we're talking about social. People can follow. I can follow people, and of course, those people can follow people. So I can start chaining through, if you think of an organizational structure, I could write a social app that actually crawled through and created a, an ecosystem or a, an org chart, not based on the structure of the company, but based on following and followers. 
How wild would it be to create an app that showed the person who is most followed in the company, particularly if it wasn't the CEO? Be kind of cool. So you can write these kinds of apps where you trace following and followers. Now, I can also follow documents. I can follow tags. And I can follow sites. So these are the four primary entities that you're dealing with when you're working with, follow, with the whole following infrastructure. Two of these social actors, the person and um, the sites, are actually primary objects that we can code against in the social ecosystem. In following tags and documents, those are a little bit, those are uh, different entities. And as I said, Andrew's uh, talk yesterday, he talks in much more detail about how those entities are different when you're trying to trace followers. Now, when you're on a site, we have community sites now. And community sites have discussions. So it's possible for me to find all of the people who follow a site who have participated in a discussion and then look at their merit because we now have new features inside the community sites that track merit badges and points against the social, um, against the, uh, the environment. The cool thing about merit is that merit can be different from one site to another. So if you have a highly active site, you might want to dial down the merit a little bit. And if you have a site where it's much harder to answer a question, you might want to ramp those points up a bit. And so you can do that inside of SharePoint on, on a site by site, community site by community site basis. So I also have followers. These are the people who choose to follow me. Okay, so I can now start tracking the sites of the people who follow me to find out the interests, find out their merit. And it goes on from there. I have microblog posts. Microblog posts can have links, they can have mentions, they can have likers. They can have video associated with them. So I chose to stop there because once I start drawing all of the lines to all of the things that can be connected, it all ultimately comes back to the people in this ecosystem and what they're doing. What I'm very interested to find out is in the next rev, I won't say next version, but next rev and the rev after that, is to start using some of the new graphing technology and some of the new data mining technology to run reports against this, to find out the most popular documents in the, in the company, find out the most liked post in the company, hashtags that are being followed more heavily than other hashtags, things like that. So you get an idea that there is a rich ecosystem of objects to be able to follow inside of SharePoint, and there's an API to, to go after all of this information. So what do you want to do? Do you want to work with user profiles? Do you want to work with social feeds? Working with, with um, site feeds is also a possibility. And you can also work with community sites. I put an asterisk on the community site because the community site is subtly different in that it doesn't participate directly in the social like these other items do. Because essentially, the discussions on a community site are an upgraded discussion list. So any of the actions that you want to take on a discussion list in a community site, you can use the same technology you're using to, to do uh, client-side object model against tasks and other list items. It's essentially just a list. So I'm not going to be talking about that one here, but I will be talking about user profiles, the social feeds, and the site feeds. So when you're looking at your options, you have a lot of options. Depending on what you're trying to build, the intersection of these technologies is all presented here in the slide. So if I'm going to use the server-side object model, then I could, use you know, I could use PowerShell. I could write a timer job. I could write a web part, a full trust web part. But in that web part, I could use JavaScript, et cetera. So depending on how you want to build, craft, and create, and then deploy your application, you have to decide on the, on the approach. And the approach is going to drive how your team builds the, tech, builds the solution. But it's also possible that you may decide that I have a team that's available and they know this technology. Because sadly, sometimes that's the way these decisions are made. And so if you have a Ruby on Rails team and you have a month and you need to build out this particular thing, then they can go after it with SharePoint. Okay. It may not be your first choice, but at least you have a decision matrix that you can use to build your social applications. 
So when you're working with the client-side object model, when you're working with the client-side object model, depending on how your client code runs, you can go after the SharePoint, um, the SharePoint um, client service endpoint. Now, when you're using these client service endpoints or you're going straight with REST, the one thing that they've done, well, the one most notable thing as a developer that they have done is they've shortened the URL that we have to use. So they've gotten rid of VTI underscore, underscore VTI underscore bin slash client service, and all of that is contained in the underscore API URL. So throughout my demos today, you'll be seeing me use the underscore API URLs. But when you're using a JavaScript library, the Silverlight library, or the .NET CLR library, it's going against the client service um, endpoint by, through the uh, underscore API URL. Now, if you're using OData and you're using REST, then you're essentially writing all of the plumbing. Okay, you're going to be writing all of the plumbing. And that's if you're not able to use one of those three libraries to help you, then you can use REST. And a lot of my demos today are using REST because I think there's a lot of folks that are still kind of wrapping their head around how to use it, so I'll be touching on that. So I wanted to build up a couple of different, I wanted to build up a couple of different options for the user profile service and talk about what you can do. This is what you can do remotely with the client object model. So against the user profile service, you can fetch profiles and properties. So you can say, I want to get Ruby's uh, user profile properties, and you can pull those back in a single call. You can also get feeds, and you can get replies. Now, when you get the feeds and you get the replies, you're going to be getting a lot of raw data. There will be a .text attribute that you can pull to see the raw text of it. But if you want to incorporate all of the markup for the at mentions and the hashtags, then you're going to have to do a little bit of assembly. But all of the information is embedded in the response for you to be able to do that. You can update the user profile only the photo. Okay, so the only property on the user profile that you can update is the photo. And then you can create posts for the current user. You can't do impersonation with the, um, with the uh, client-side object model. So if you have an application that's running and somebody takes an action in that application and you want to have the application post back to SharePoint impersonating that user, the, um, the um, client-side object model doesn't support that. What can you not do? Well, you can't find out if a user exists. So you can't say, hey, SharePoint, does this guy exist in your environment? You cannot create user profiles. You can't change user profiles beyond just the, um, beyond just the picture. And you can't delete user profiles or create a post on behalf of somebody else. So I want half of you to send an email to somebody that you are friendly with at Microsoft and say, please, please, please add that feature. Because we really want to be able to do that. Maybe have an account that's allowed to do that. It would be kind of cool, because that way we can get some really neat social automation going from the client side. Now, one of the things you couldn't do in 2010 that you can do in 2013 is in 2010, from the client, you couldn't ask for non-out-of-the-box user profile properties. And in 2013, they've given us the ability to get your custom user profile properties out of um, the SharePoint user profile service. And I'll show you how to do that in just a sec. So let's start out and talk about the social feeds and the JavaScript object model. And so what I've got is a demo that incorporates search into, incorporates social into search. And I'll show it to you first. I'm going to search for SharePoint here. And I'm going to jump over to the People tab. And I'll get my people, OK? I'm going to scroll down to Ruby, who's quite the social animal. And I'll hover over her, um, over her record here. And what you'll notice is right here, I've got her SharePoint social feeds. So incorporating new functionality into existing SharePoint um, capability is, very, is quite trivial 
with the new model that they have for search design templates. So search uses design templates. You don't have to know XSL anymore. And you can get in and actually add capability to SharePoint. So at a high level, what I've done is simply gone into, um, gone into my master page gallery for my site, go into display templates, into search, and I copied, rather than modifying the out-of-the-box ones, I copied the item person and the item person hover panel and created an item person social. I'll edit that in one note. I'm sorry, in uh, Notepad++. And I created an item person social hover panel. So all that item person social does is re-register my preview. So as I scroll down through all this JavaScript, you'll see that there's this hover URL tag right here. And so all I did was say, hey, when you run, I want you to run, instead of the out-of-the-box hover panel, I want you to run my item person social hover panel. So that's all the code that's in that one. In the item person social hover panel, what I did was added some JavaScript that starts right about here, declare a couple of global variables, and then I created this um, function called get feeds that accepts a target user. Then I have a little property here called show errors, which I'll show you in just a sec. I go out and I get a client context, and then I instantiate the social feed manager with that client context. So this is using the, the JavaScript object model for SharePoint to get the social feed manager. With that feed manager, I then instantiate social feed options. I simply do this because 20 feeds is too many to show, and I figure getting the last five is probably good enough. And so I set the max thread count to five. And then you have options for which feed you want to get. In my case, I'm getting a targeted user feed, so I'm using get feed four. But I went ahead and left the code in here so you could see the, uh, how to get a news feed or how to get a personal feed in case those are the things that you want to go after. And then um, down here, I execute a query asynchronously. And I simply take in a parameter of show errors so that I could show you what happens when it fails as well as what happens when it's successful. Once that happens, once that's called, it comes back, it iterates through my feeds, and essentially just belches it out onto the screen for me with some text. So the rest of that's just display code. Now, when you're working inside the search hover panels, you have to make sure that the whole UI is loaded before you make your call. Okay? So timing is everything when it comes to working inside the hover panel. And so there's a super secret method that you can call. And essentially, what you do is you render, here it is right here, you render, you add post render callback. And so what happens is after the whole Chrome and everything has been rendered, it says, OK, now I'll call your code. And then, because timing really is everything, we have to make sure the functions that we need are loaded. So I add in here an execute function with the dependency on my SPJS file to make sure that it all works. But that's where you see get feeds. So this is actually where the hover panel is popping up, calling my feed, calling my code to go get the feed. The way it gets the current user is off of the context of the current found user. That's this CTX variable that's instantiated all the way at the top of the page. So the context there is actually decorated with all of the managed properties that were returned in the search result. And I happen to know that it's called account name. So that's going to pass in for Ruby, DHT Ruby, and for Willa, DHT slash Willa. So those things show up. We get our feeds, and the code runs, and we're able to see it. Now, I will only do this once unless you guys are complete maniacs for JavaScript. But some folks haven't seen how you can actually troubleshoot this stuff. And so what I'm going to do is I've got my debugging set up over here. And um, I'm going to switch to my item person social uh, hover panel. And this is the actual output JavaScript that you'll see. So what I do is I throw in these console log, logs. And I'll throw a breakpoint there. So that when I, uh, and, and 
doing uh, debugging of hover, of hover panels is just, it's just so much fun because you have to be really careful where you put your mouse while you're doing your debugging. So you'll ne notice that I'm kind of dancing around the perimeter of my page. But let me rerun the page. And if I hover here over Wrigley, it's going to stop and it's going to break on my hover panel. And so now I can use F10, I can step through my code and do what I need to do. Now in this case, it's going to throw an error. So this is that show errors true. To participate in the social, to have a news feed, to have a feed at all, you have to have a my site. And so one of the errors, if you're working in social, one of the errors that you're going to want to trap for is this no personal site exists for this user. It means that they haven't created a my site. It is absolutely the most common error I run into, particularly in my demo environment, because I've only created my sites for a few of my, uh, a few of my members. But I wanted to show you that, and it comes out with this internal code 81, which changed from an in internal code of 9. So if you have demo code that you've already built, this is one of the ways that you can trap for that and, um, and make sure that you can get around, those, um, get around those errors. Now I am going to go ahead and drop down here and hover over Ruby. That breaks my code again. Whoops. That breaks my code again. It allows me to see what's going on. And again, I can step through the code and see what's happening. Now, it's really annoying to have these guys pop up all the time. So one of the things you can do in your code is you can do console.writes or console.logs. And if you do console.logs, then you can actually have the debugger running with no breakpoints, and you can just let your code write to that JavaScript debugging console. So particularly with hovers, because every time you touch the hover, it's going to break. And then you have to step through the hover. Right? So what I find is that using this console.log technique helps me to see what's going on. So I'll show you what it looks like in real time. I'm going to clear the console here, and I'm going to move this guy over. And what I'll do is drop down here and hover over, let me see, hover over Cheyenne Shups. This is Eric's dog. And you'll see that it goes ahead and renders that in my code. If I drop down to Ruby, Ruby's already been rendered, so it's not redoing the JavaScript. I'll go to Hank. There it is. Go up to Titan. So you see that you can actually get some level of kind of a debug trace going while you're doing your JavaScript that works very well for figuring out what's going wrong or what's going right with your, uh, with your code. Thank you very much. I did not write that. I just wrote the code that writes to it. The guy who wrote this deserves absolutely all the credit. Question. Um, so if you're using uh, like Firefox, uh, then, then um, I'm not sure if the con I have found cases where console.log doesn't work. But when you're in IE and developing to IE, this does work. OK? Yeah? Then, OK, so the question is, the activity feed is stored, the activity feed records are stored in their personal site, they delete their personal site, yes, the data is gone. Well, you'd have to, you'd have to resurrect their personal site from your IT Pro backups that you've been doing. Yeah. Yes, it is, it is stored in the, uh, in the personal site. So it does become part of your backup strategy to make sure you're maintaining that. All righty. So like I said, this is kind of a tools demo. I wanted you guys to be able to, uh, to come away with, um, with some tools you can use. So that's the first one. So social feeds in search, the general pattern is go ahead and grab a social feed manager, set your social options, choose the social feed type, execute a query either asynchronously or synchronously, depending on the technology you're using, and then you're off to the races. This was just in case, because uh, earlier this week, I wasn't certain that I was going to have a network connection, so I think we're all good to go. So let's talk about using REST. So for using REST, your options become greater. And this is where you'll see that I am no UI expert. Okay, So what we're going to do is we're going to set up the demo based on my, uh, my polar bear in a snowstorm theme. Okay or the invisible castle theme, if you will. And this is my SharePoint post-o-matic. And before you ask yes, I'd be happy to. If you're actually interested at the end, I'll give you all the code. It's not that big a deal. 
So this is, a, uh, this is a page that's just an HTML page that's running under a SharePoint context. And what I'm, what I'm able to do is put in an end user. I'll put in Ruby here. And I'll hit Get Personal Feed. And I'm able to get the personal feed using the REST interface. In fact, what I can do is uh, let me go out here and get Willas, because that's who I'm logged in as. So Willa's been a little bit more busy. She's the one I've been demoing with. And I can even create a post on behalf of Willa, not um, with, with a, just a regular HTML page and some jQuery. So I'm going to do, uh, how do you like this demo? And I'll create a post. And so the text that you saw initially, things are running much faster than they were before, so I haven't put any pauses in here. But I'll walk through what I just did. What I just did was two calls. I did one to go authenticate me against the site and get a token that would allow me to hit the site again with a post. The post is the text that I just put up. And so this round trip authentication, you've probably seen three or four different ways here at the, at the conference. And I'll show you the way that's been working very well for me in, in the least amount of code. And so I just did this. How do you like this demo? And so what I'll do is go ahead and get Willa's personal feed again. And so what you'll see is here's that new post that we just put up. How do you like this demo? And if I go out to her, um, if I go out to her my site, that's Ruby's my site. Let me go out to Willis here. So here is the how do you like this demo post that we just put up. Now it's a pretty plain vanilla post, and later on I'll show you how we can add some mentions and things like that. But it's pretty straightforward. So the code behind this is, uh, let me close these guys down. The code behind this is pretty straightforward. I've got my, this is my HTML page. This is the page you're seeing rendered on the screen. I've simply got a couple of buttons and a couple of text boxes. So I'm going to pass in the account name from the account name input box, and I'm going to call get personal feed. Over here, I have the, uh, the get personal feed where I accept that account. And then I use my first RESTful endpoint, which is using this actor item. Okay, so I have to pass in the actor, the social actor, that I'm interested in working with. And then I do an AJAX call that allows me to do a, uh, do a get. And I pass in the URL. And that's all I need to do. I don't need to pass in any additional data. Gets are free. And I, can, uh, I pass in a, a, um, a header an accept header for application JSON and the verbose O data to allow me to get my information back. Then I go here and I process my data, processing the data. First I clear the list, and then I just go through. And for each post that I find, I grab the root post text and append it. So pretty straightforward, very easy to do with that social data. Now, creating the post requires a little bit more work. So I created this little accessory function called getToken. And disregard the ID for now, but essentially all I do is post to context info for the site that I'm working on. Posting to context info returns to me a token in the form of a form digest value. That form digest value, you saw it sprint across the screen. When the, when the demo's running more slowly, it actually kind of hangs there for a while. And, um, and sometimes when I'm first starting up, it'll hang there for a long time. But the demo gods have been nice to me, so it's, it's going by. But I'll show it to you again. And then what I do is I look, and if I don't have an ID, then I go ahead and call post to my feed. Post to my feed takes in the message that I'm interested in posting and that authentication token. And then I post to this RESTful endpoint, which is feed slash post. I pass in some REST creation data. And in this case, I take the easy way out. I simply pass in the message as my context text, content text. And then under my request digest, I return that token. Now SharePoint accepts that entire packet and says, yep, you have a token, token hasn't expired, you've got a message, you've got a properly crafted so, or a, a JSON body, and it creates the post for me. So I'll show you how fast that happens one more time. 
close down search here. So if I go in here and change this to Ruby, the get happens almost instantaneously. But if I, uh, if I do the post, when I create that post, watch that success message. First thing you'll see is the token, and then you'll see the success. Okay, so that token, there's nothing really important in it. What is cool if you inspect it is at the end, it has when it's going to expire. So you know how long your sessions are set by looking at that token. So having that code to be able to run that token was kind of a, a pretty, pretty important key to working with SharePoint. Now, on the, uh, yeah, I know, we'll come into that. OK, so what if you want to do more? What if you want to, um, let me go back to getting Ruby's feed here. What if you want to do more? What if you want to do a reply? Well, the replies are quite simple. All you do is instead of passing in a null ID, you just pass in the ID of the thread that you're applying to. It's very much a no-brainer. Yeah, question. It's, the, it's returned as part of the REST package. I'll show you. Actually, when I do the ID get, I'll, I'll debug that and show you where you're getting that. Um, so I'm going to get the personal feed. And at the top of this file, what I have is a simple little function that I thought was tremendously cool. I'm beginning to really love jQuery. If you've never used this live function, this says, so you can attach, an, uh, you can attach a um, event to any object that exists on the page it, with jQuery. But if you use live, it says any object that exists on the page now and forever. So I have this dynamic list. And so instead of having to iterate through it, I simply add that to my onReady. And every time I add new items to my list, it will, append, it will automatically add that event to the items on the page. This was news to me. So now what I have is um, after I get my token, if I have an ID, I create a post reply. And so what that means is I simply add every time I, uh, every time I have a new list item post, I add the ID of the source element so that I have threads. And so underlying this page, underlying this page, every one of these items on the page has the post ID appended to it as an ID. So if I click it, I'm going to post a reply instead of posting a new item. So let's see if that works. Uh, let's do reply to Ruby at SPC11. And I'm going to click up here instead. There's my token. Post was replied. I go back in here. I go to the news feed, people that I'm following. So here's Ruby's post, the one about her Halloween video. And down here is the reply to Ruby at SPC11 that I just posted from my little post-o-matic. Okay, so you can create replies. You can create new posts. And the only difference in your code, the only difference in your code is that you, uh, that you take that, that ID and pass in the post ID on your REST creation package. Okay? Now, I'm starting to use the word post, just like Andrew used uh, follow yesterday, but I'll try to make this a little bit faster. So we also have site feeds. So we have our global corporate feed which I've been showing you on the news feed page. And we also have site feeds. So on the site feeds, if I go to this team site, here's the news feed on this team site. The URL for this is a little bit different when you create it. In fact, it's kind of odd if you've done a lot of SharePoint development. So I wanted to point this out. You'll notice that I'm posting to the root web. I'm using intranet slash API, even though the site that I'm posting to is actually a team site under the intranet. And so what you do is you actually construct the URL to post to the news feed page as the actor. So before we posted the actor to the user, now we're saying the actor is now a site. And so I'm going to post to that. And so I'll do this real quick. Just go in here. 
create that social post, and I can get the site posts, HTTP, intranet, slash sites, slash team. I can get those posts, or I can post a new one. So when I get that post, you'll see hello from SPC 11. And it is, in fact, on that team site page. If I refresh the team site, you'll see it says hello from SPC 11. So posting to sites, posting to feeds, it's all kind of the same. You just have to know the tricks on the URLs. And that's just a gratuitous opportunity for me to show you my dogs. There we go. OK. So your REST URLs matter. If you're posting to a social feed, then you want to use the, uh, you want to use the social feed um, capabilities. If you're posting to a site, then you still use social feed, but the site becomes the actor in the feed that you're posting to. When you get a response, I didn't show you. And actually, just for time's sake, I'll show you after I'm all done, because I get the room when we're done. And I'll show you, how, I'll show you what, that, um, what that context API looks like when we're all finished up. So the, uh, the social feed, when it comes back, it's rich information. Because I get all the information about the actor that posted the feed. So I only showed you a little bit of information, but I wanted to put this slide up so you could see that this is just a small part of the information that you get back in those responses. When you create a post, you simply post to the, uh, the URL that you want, adding that token. And then when you create the post body, you can go through and create build up that post body so that it works for your, um, for your application. Now calling the user profile service, we're going to use the REST API to call the user profile service. And so in this case, what I have is a user profile app that's going to do the same thing. So in this case, I can get a whole user profile and return that with REST. But what you'll notice is this is not all 79 out-of-the-box properties. Okay? This is a subset of those properties that you can get from your get the user profile. And like I said, you can get specific user profile properties by using a, different, a slightly different call. I can go get that user profile name. So if I change this to Ruby. I can get that user profile preferred name. So you can actually make requests of specific properties. And like I said, in SharePoint uh, 2013, unlike SharePoint 2010, I can get custom properties. So in this case, I have this custom property called Twitter screen name. And I can go get that for Ruby, which is at Golden Dog Ruby. And uh, for Willa, it's, uh, it's my user profile. I'm sorry, it's, my, uh, it's mine, which is at Matthew McDee. What that means is that I can then take information that's on the user profile and turn it around and go use it for my own evil purposes. Right? So I can have, an, uh, have a user store information about themselves, or I can have a third process come in and store information about that user that I can then in interrogate off of the user profile service and do something with. So in this case, let's go get the tweets for a user. So what I just did was round tripped, go to the user profile service, get the user profile's Twitter name, then go out to Twitter and pull back five or so of their posts. So I did that. And then uh, this was the one from this morning. I've decided to become a vegetarian because the walk to breakfast is shorter for special meals. So. Um, so you can do this. And it's not that hard to do once you kind of figure out the plumbing. So I'm going to jump over here to my tweet lab. And the first thing is that get user profile. So you pass in an account name. You pass in API. In this case, it's SP user profiles people manager. And then you say get, profile, get properties for an account name. And it will return the properties for that account. And that's a get request. It's quite easy to do. Now, getting a specific property requires using the get user profile property for URL. 
and then you pass in not just the account name, but you also pass in the property name. So in this case, I'm passing in the property name that I'm looking for to get those specific user profiles. The Twitter part is right here. So I pass in the account name. I happen to know that I only want to use the custom property that I created, my DHT uh, Twitter screen name. And then I process the user profile service. Down here, after the call returns, I write out the, uh, I write out the text of that property to the screen, and then I call get tweets. And what get tweets does is uses JSONP to go and call the Twitter API to return the tweets for that user based on their screen name. And so that is the function at the end here called process request. So when I call process request, I drop in here, and for each, um, for each tweet that comes back, I simply append the text to the screen. And for all that talking, it takes absolutely no time at all to, uh, to return those tweets. Right? So it's really quick. It's nice and fast. And it's super lightweight because I don't necessarily, I mean, could I do this in a content editor web part? I don't think you'd ever want to. But the script that you have to do to make this happen is actually pretty trivial to be able to get this level of functionality. So when you're using the user profile, if you're on the box, you can use the Microsoft Office Server User Profiles DLL, just like you've been using in 2010. If you're off the box and you're using .NET, then you use client.userprofiles. If you're using JavaScript, then it's spuserprofiles.js. And if you're using REST, then you're going to be using the spuserprofiles people manager. Here's an example of the REST that I was using today. And essentially, this one just calls get user profile properties for the account name. And then in this case, we're fetching that preferred name. So what about when we start looking at pulling it all together? And this is where that story comes in. So one of the things I like to preach when you're looking at how are we going to solve a problem is rapid prototyping end to end. A lot of people are good at rapid prototyping. But they don't actually consider all of the systems that are involved. So in the case of the demo that I wanted to build, I have a SharePoint 2013 site. And I wrote a SharePoint 2013 app that communicates with that site. And all of that was working great. But I wanted to do a little bit more. I didn't think that demo was, was really that great. Essentially, it's the same post-omatic demo that you've been seeing. Lots of JavaScript, lots of client-based calls. Then I started noodling around and found out that there are ways that you can call SharePoint from off the box. So I stood up another system. In my case, I stood up CRM. And I started trying to figure out, how are we going to get CRM to talk to SharePoint? In SharePoint 2010, I did this demo. And I used the SharePoint CSOM or used the SharePoint web services to do the conversation. But those aren't an option for us anymore, because they've tightened it all down so that if we're going to use the client-side object model, we have to have an entry point. We have to have an approved way of getting ourselves into SharePoint 2013. Well, it turns out that there is an approved way to do this. You can use the request executor. So there is a special SharePoint um, JavaScript library that's, that's part of your installation that is called the sp.requestexecutor.js. And Scott Hillier wrote a really cool article on how to use it to go get site properties. And you've probably seen a couple of demos this week on how to use this thing. What it does is it actually instantiates a little iframe that handles the authentication to your app. And then that then lets you talk to your site or to your farm. Okay, So these sites, these, um, these apps that you're writing, can actually just be little sleeper agents for you with no functionality other than the permissions that allow you to be able to write against the app and work with your server and your farm. So our goal here is to write an app that allows us when an end user posts a win. So salesperson, they used to have the, uh, you, know, you start off the little company, 
and you have one salesperson. And then when you get two salespeople, you have to hire a sales manager. When you hire a sales manager, the very first thing he goes out and buys is a bell. Because whenever one of his two minions makes a sale, he rings the bell, right? Build up that company pride, get the sales going. Of course, when it becomes a global company and you're ringing the bell in Austin, they're not hearing it in Belgium, right? So we need a better way. And the better way is let's use SharePoint. Let's post to the activity feed, let's post to the news feed and say, we posted a sale. So I had this idea. Let's go to, let's go to our CRM server in this case. And in our CRM server, we've got all these opportunities. But let's create a, let's create a little app. This is part of my rapid prototyping. Oh, I'm sorry. All you're, all you're missing is me typing in a URL. But uh, so I've got my little create post um, application again. OK? So the first thing I did was say, wow, all this, all this REST stuff's working great. Let's copy that over to that other server, and let's just get the feed. Yeah, you can't do that. You can't do that because it's a cross-domain post. right? You can't, you can't make that request. It's not going to allow you to do it. But if I use Request Executor, Request Executor is going to stand up a little iframe for me. It's going to authenticate me over to my app. My app's going to talk to the, to the farm. And I can go get the feeds. So this allows you to do cross-domain queries to a SharePoint app. And that works great. In fact, I can even go in here and create a post. I used to type in hello from CRM because I was that optimistic. Now I'm just going to type in hello from Corgi because I'm certain you're figuring out where this is going. So I'm going to do hello from Corgi and I'll go ahead and do SPC 12. I think I've been doing SPC 11, haven't I? And I'll take a sec and there's our post was successfully published. So we'll drop down here. We'll bring this up. Oh, people following. So here it is, hello from Corgi, SPC 11. So great, we're on our way. I have a blank web page. How much harder could it be to make it work in CRM? Well, it's actually not hard to extend CRM. It has these functions that allow you to Im embed JavaScript into actions on the, um, on the site so that when an opportunity is won, you can run some JavaScript. That's great but they specifically block CRM, specifically blocks cross-domain calls, even when you're using fancy cross-domain calls like the one I just did. So I got down to the wire on this. I was so excited. Because why do I want to call out of JavaScript? I want to call out of JavaScript because I'm making the call as the salesperson who's posting the sale. That's why I mentioned earlier you can't do impersonation. I want to make the call out of JavaScript because I'm in the client window. And so it's going as me. Well, you can't do it. And I finally found some documentation in the CRM way down at the bottom. It says, you can use jQuery only if you're calling back to CRM. So they specifically block it. But don't despair. I have another demo up my sleeve. So there are two technologies for extending CRM. And that's the tail. The tail is. Never stop trying to figure out how to solve this problem, OK? Now, this may not be the pretty solution, but it's pretty darn cool that it actually works. So first, I'm going to show you what it looks like, and then we'll jump into code. So here I am, logged in as Willa in CRM. She's working in her dashboard. She's looking at open opportunities. And she's going to close this deal for search and rescue videos for $50,000. So she goes up here. She says, close is one. She says, Yay. And she hits OK. That's her user experience. Okay, We don't want to get in her way. We want her to go make another sale. But what's just happened on the back end is CRM ran, and it created the post for us. It created the post for us. So when Willa goes out and looks at her, looks at her, uh, Newsfeed. feed, 
what she'll see is a mention. And here, oh, sorry. Oh, I don't have Zoom it. Oh, I don't have Zoom it installed here. Do I? Anyway, you guys, can you guys see that okay? So right here, CRM sales robot posted, Willis Shepard closed a deal for $50,000 for the project search and rescue videos. The thing that's neat about this is that if I have access to CRM, I can click on that link and I can go look at the project. I can go look at the opportunity that she closed. And I can also click on here and be taken to Willis site. So that's an at mention, that's a link. The way that we do that in CRM is, first of all, there's a whole lot of CRM plumbing at the top of this that makes this plugin work. But the relevant lines in, for SharePoint are actually quite small. So what I've done is created a, a, a function called create social post. Create social post. And down here, I have the my site. I make the post. And then right here is the trick. The trick is grab a client context grab a feed manager, create a post idea, or create a social post creation data, and then make the post string be ready for your substitution. So here's my at mention, and here's the, uh, the actual revenue I didn't do as a link, I just embedded it there, but then here's my project name. And then up above, I did some CRM goodness that went out and got the name of the user and, or the, uh, the actual account of the user. And then I create content items. Now this is where you have to be a little clever. You don't say, this is the content item for one, this is the content item, or I'm sorry, this is the content item for index zero, and this is the content item for index one. You have to add them in the order that you want the replacement to happen up above, okay? So it's actually, you're creating an array of content items, and then you're creating your content text, and that array is just pumped into it when it's created. And then SharePoint does the rest of the wiring. The other thing that SharePoint does for us is it handles all of the notification. So you notice that when I first came to this, it had that at mention. Here, let me go ahead and run it again, and you can watch the, uh, watch the debug window go by as well. Let me clear out my debug window. Go back to CRM here. Minimize this guy just a little bit. And I love having these wider monitors for demos. We'll drop all the way down. And let's find a SharePoint 2010 farm for rack space for uh, $125,000. We'll go ahead and close this as one. And what you'll see is I've got debug code because this runs asynchronously. And what you'll see in the debug view is it went ahead and ran. When it ran, it posted that. So what SharePoint's gonna do for me is a number of things. First of all, it's gonna pop up the mentions here in just a second. And then it's going to also email Willa and say, hey, somebody mentioned you. So just in case she's not following this, this, um, this account, there's our mention one. We refresh, here's our sales robot, close the deal for the project SharePoint 2010 Farm. So not a perfect solution, but what we call, we call this a bot solution, is that this is an account that people would follow that's handling some of the notification for your company. And, um, and this would be an account that, of course, you have to create a user profile for because without a user profile, you do not get to participate in the social. Okay, so the very first error you will run into when you do this is a very cryptic error that is a challenge to understand, and then it will dawn on you that when you try to log into SharePoint as this user, it'll say, working on it. And then it will say, give us a minute, your user profile is being created. And then you'll run the code again, and it'll all work, because that user has to have a profile to be able to participate in the social. So, I implore you, take an end-to-end -end approach when you start working with these technologies. Deciding how you're going to make stuff happen. I spent too much time figuring out how to format money. I should have spent more time on how to figure out how to get the JavaScript to run so that it would happen as the end user. Would have saved me a ton of time. 
Work out the details later. Make sure that your solution is working end to end first. Consider where you're connecting from. When you're connecting into SharePoint from a remote device, you have to consider the consumption device that you're using, what, people are, what people's end user experience is going to be like, and how you're going to support it in the long run. Choose the right API, or if it's a SharePoint app, what you'll find is you're doing a lot of the mix of many different APIs to be able to make your apps happen. Earlier this week, there was a, a really cool app. It was the, uh, it was the Movember app for uh, the mustache mashup app, uh, you know, demonstrating how to do social with, uh, with the mashups. But also, he demonstrated a Kudos app that can run as a SharePoint app, or it can run as a, uh, an app out in Azure, depending on how you want to do the storage. If you haven't seen those sessions, absolutely worth the time. And then use apps as your entry point when you're having to do these cross-domain calls. When you're trying to do the cross-domain libraries, it's just like using Ajax, except you're instantiating the request.executor. And then the syntax changes just a little bit. But literally, once I figured it out, it took me about 10 minutes to convert everything that I had running locally in SharePoint over to using this new API. So that's what I have for today. Please remember to fill out your surveys. I know it's the end of the conference, but the surveys absolutely matter. I'd love to know what you liked and didn't like. And um, for those of you who are interested in the, in the gruesome details of that one, uh, that one request, I'll show that off. For the rest of you, I'll just go ahead and blog it. And uh, you can get to me at, at ableblue.com slash blog is my blog. Um, and you can always email me at Matthew, Matthew at aptalon.com. There are no questions. I want to thank you all for coming. I hope you had a great show. Good luck on the motorcycle.